leave aside for law. The only way the citizens have to do things now is change the Constitution. I, I come at this from a, a similar conservative position as does um, uh, Earl, but uh, my conservatism is on the side of democracy. Uh, our system of government is based on a representative form. That's why we are a republic. A republic, uh, in addition to meaning that you do not have a monarchy, it also means that most of your governmental decisions are made not by direct vote of the people, but through elected representatives. I think that's a system which has generally served as well. And it concerns me that in so many areas here in Florida, we seem to be moving away from that principle. Uh, in the ability of local governments to decide the level of services that their people want and are willing to pay for by determining who is going to be elected. Uh, we're, the state has been increasingly uh, taking over that uh, role, limiting the ability of local communities to uh, respond to their needs as they see them to be. And similarly, I'm concerned that if you turn all of the minutia uh, that would be encompassed uh, uh, into a direct vote of the people, that would be a very stultifying uh, thing. It also somewhat assumes that we are now at perfection, and if we could just keep anything from happening uh, in the future, it would be all right. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I think that we are some, somewhat distant from perfection, and that we're going to need uh, a little ability to act in order to get closer. I think the question is on hometown democracy. Do you want to take hometown a, democracy. a shot at it? Or? Whatever. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? I've wrestled with this, as most people, I think, have wrestled with it for quite some time. I'm not even sure where I am right now, except that I've probably, in, in uh, recent months, been giving more play to hometown democracy than I had before. And I think I, I'm concerned about a number of things with that. Uh, I certainly use the word stultify right now. That may be well the case. Uh, when I think about California, or I think about Ohio, or some of the places that's been used, has quite still you know, stopped development in some of those areas. Uh, but, I, but I'm still concerned about what is being proposed there, particularly since it would be a constitutional amendment, and I am very reluctant on that part. But on the other hand, I'm also concerned with basically, you, know, you mentioned the growth machines before, Earl, and there are all sorts of growth machines. There are as many and more probably positive growth machines are on negative growth machines that, that hurt our environment and the social and our economic situation. But I'm concerned with some of those that are very short-sighted in terms of their interest and in their, I'll call it greed. And I'm asking myself and trying to respond to this question, which am I concerned with the most and might be the most harmful to Florida? Well, I've seen that growth machine doing a lot of things in Florida. The other thing I have a lot of questions about, and I might be leaning a little bit this way right now, but I'm not totally settled yet. Uh, Shannon? Uh, Shannon uh, Estinos with the Water Management District and a student at FAU, Professor Miller's um, Governor, Professors, I'm going to ask a question that I already know the answer to, but I just want to give all the public the opportunity to, 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 to talk to us. <coughs> we are a uh, legislative time session, but uh, committee meetings have to and we are hearing that as it faces this budget crisis, uh, it is looking at agency elimination um, as a possible way of cutting costs. And our understanding is that the agency that is number one on the chopping block right now is the EPA. So um, I was hoping that maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the implications that such a decision would have on the future of the state, certainly on our, our planning efforts. Uh, it would be sort of like asking the question, what if you had open heart surgery and they didn't put it back in? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
PhD from Rutgers and planning and Department of Economics at FIU retired. And I first I'd like to congratulate like the authors for this uh, tremendous lecture and personally for Senator Graham for his great vote in opposing the war in Iraq. It was very great. Uh, my question though, I did serve with Charlie Zwick, and I am a personal friend on that committee. And at that time, we understood that the cost of growth, the economic cost exceeded the economic benefits. So it really wasn't a surprise and an unfortunate thing to say, I told you so. The BBC has currently run a series, essentially about the end of the American century, the British <coughs> If we use this issue of there's no, if we want to use this as a crisis, uh, given, in my view, most of the three major urban areas are bordering on being unlivable, South Florida, Megalopolis, Capital St. Pete, and Orlando. Do you think it's possible, using this crisis, to overcome this regionalism because these urban areas together clearly have at least 60 to 70 percent of the vote? and use the crisis as a measure to restore this and overcome all these demographic issues and other noise that separates this. Do you think this could be possible? Or are we really at the end of this? Maybe we're at this downward spiral. Well, I would say Florida is, uh, in this area, as a number of others, rather schizophrenic. Uh, Florida, I've described Florida as being like northern Italy. Uh, we are a series of city uh, states. Uh, the typical person who lives in Tampa doesn't know or frankly care very much about what's happening in Jacksonville. And the person who lives in Pensacola doesn't know or care about what's happening in West Palm Beach. Uh, we don't have in Florida either the history uh, as a place like uh, North Carolina does, uh, or the institutions uh, that, such as communication uh, outlets, newspapers, and television that have a statewide reach that help bind other states uh, together. Now, having said that, the word city-state is over uh, expressed that it infers that there's a cohesion uh, within those nodes, and in fact, uh, the, the nodes themselves are very uh, fractured. Um, I, I have been interested in this for a long time. I, I think, and I, I'm going to <coughs> self-profess, I'm a baseball fan, but I think we're about to make one of the stupidest regional decisions, putting our baseball stadium uh, in an area where the population is, is moving north uh, and making it less likely uh, that the franchise would be a success. That would have been a perfect example around which to build a region, an element of a regional uh, strategy. Uh, I hope that I've got enough life uh, expectancy to see us make progress. Uh, but if not, I've got 11 grandchildren, and they'll uh, maybe they'll see it. <coughs> Now <clears throat> uh, I know when I'm in trouble and so forth where, where it all comes from because my grandparents came from all the <laughs> But uh, I, I agree with you on that one because particularly when we think about the media, uh, and I'm worried about the media right now. We have separation in terms of media, we have separation in terms of. Uh, you know, South Florida going its way, and Orlando going its way, and the St. Pete basically going its way. And you brought up the media, and that immediately you know, brought to mind how small these newspapers are getting these days, and how you know, less and less coverage, and uh, we're being able to find out less about what goes on in other parts of the state. If we want to refer to the media, if we want to turn on the television, okay, we'll get a, a 20 second clip, something like that. But, uh, so all of this is what's going on, I guess what I'm reacting to isn't helping in terms of bringing areas together. I have no immediate answers on that, but that's, that's a concern. In, in 1845, when Florida became a state, 
the resolution that went to the Congress was for two states, East Florida and West Florida, divided by the Swanee River. There was no consideration of South Florida because nobody knew where it was. Mosquito <laughs> County. And uh, when that got to the Congress, they counted votes and they said, well, look, those East Florida and West Florida would be slave states. And we've got a little problem with that because we want to keep the balance of the northern states versus the southern states. And if we create two states in Florida, then that switch, switches the balance to slave states. Therefore, you have one Florida. It's been like that for years. South Florida, except for old, seven, old citizens like this, was never a concern. I grew up in Polk County, and I couldn't even pronounce Miami. <laughs> <laughs> and that was only a couple hundred miles away. If I, that's if you finish, because I was. I'm finished. <laughs> uh, I can tell a little personal story about that. My father uh, ran for governor in 1944. He had a good record in the state senate, uh, in business and civic life, but he lost. And the then political writer for Miami Herald, Alan Morris, wrote a column saying the fact that Ernest Graham could not be elected governor of Florida proves it will be a cold day in hell when anybody from Miami is elected governor. By the way, that cold day did come. <laughs> so, so in January of 1979, when I was the first person from Miami to be elected a governor, it snowed. Let's take a question over here. Yes, sir. Matthew Schwartz with the Sierra Club. How do you do? Um, I heard a lot today that was very interesting. And Senator Graham was talking about compensation for rural landowners when their land goes under some kind of conservation agreement, like the state area critical concern. How do we basically buy off their rights or compensate them for their loss of the right to develop that land? <coughs> what I see a lot of hap what's happening right now in Miami Dade, I think it's been attempted somewhat in Broward. It's happening in a very big way, very quickly in Collier County, where Collier County is doing a complete revision of what's called this rural land uh, stewardship program, overlay. And you gentlemen were talking about the intensification of development in rural land. And that's going to happen in Collier County in spite of the slowdown. I wish we were doing what Senator Graham talked about and taking this time to rethink what we do with our rural lands. Collier County is the home to Big Cypress National Preserve, Fakahatchee, the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. And the plan that's going through Collier County at the moment is foreseeing developments right on the boundaries of these public lands, very important public lands. And so when we're talking about compensating landowners when they lose the rights to develop, they bought this land under a rural agreement when it was one unit for five acres. Now they're seeking to overturn or change the way that land can be developed and develop very large communities like Ave Maria and get tremendous profits from that land. How do we get compensated? How do the Florida Panthers get compensated for the loss of the habitat in that situation? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer to the question, but I, I'm, I'm all, Matthew, I'm concerned uh, with rural conservation districts, I think, theoretically. Uh, they sound pretty good. They sound quite exciting. But my concern basically comes in in terms of, here we go again, implementation. And the part of implementation I'm concerned with is that so much depends on conservation easements and keeping the areas around uh, Ama Maria's, etc. Um, somewhat undeveloped, whether they're agricultural or whether they are um, natural resource areas. But we know in agricultural areas that people who initially may sign things, they begin to die off, and the heirs have some sometimes different opinions. Or we can look at a variety of different sorts of uh, arrangements, even condominiums and so forth, and uh, some nice developments, and, and many of them, the